Hey, how is everybody enjoying the conference so far? Yeah, okay, so you didn't all drink too much wine at lunch and you're still with me. <laughs> um, all right, so first of all, what a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm so grateful to be asked to come and uh, talk about something that's really, really dear to me um, and I'm sure to all of you as well, which is our community. And um, I was totally exhilarated when I got asked um, to come here, I mean, to come to Florence, to get to meet all of the people in the PyCon Italia uh, community, also coming with some friends, familiar faces. And I've been thinking about this topic of leadership in the community for a while now, so I really wanted to kind of bring it here, start the discussion. Um, I'm not going to stand here and give you a defined set of answers, because I don't have them. But I really want to share with you what I've been thinking about and some of the experiences that I've built over the recent years that I've been involved in the community. And hopefully that's going to spark a conversation that you know, we'll have everyone during the conference talking about and maybe also beyond the conference days. And another reason why this has kind of been on my mind is because as I go along my journey of being a developer, I'm also thinking about the different tech leadership roles that we have in our professional teams. And as I started to reflect on this, I saw a lot of parallels. So I'd also like to propose that there are things that we can learn from the community um, when we're talking about our professional roles. So. I have very specific things I'd like you to think about um, during this talk, and I'm just going to tell you them up front, so or, you know, nothing difficult, no difficult questions in this talk, um, but just some things to reflect on while I'm discussing this topic. So I'd really like you to think about um, what does leadership look like in the community? Like maybe you already have a defined answer, maybe by the end of this you'll have a different idea, or maybe you haven't really thought about it and this is a time to reflect on that. So who are those leaders? Um, who are your role models that are doing this? And how do they shape how our communities look? I'd then like you to also think about what does inclusive leadership mean and what that means to you. So I'm going to talk about what it means to me and to the people that I know in the community, but think about for yourselves what this is. And lastly, I'd like you to think about what professional team leaders can potentially learn from the community leaders and how we can make those positions more accessible to more folks um, so that we see more diversity within technical leadership roles. So I have mentioned a couple of terms there, and I, I think it's totally OK that folks uh, might be thinking, what do you mean by this? Or like, you know, what are we specifically talking about? Um, so I'm just going to give you like my definition. Um, it's not like a Wikipedia entry. It's more kind of like what I feel is relevant context for this talk. So there's different types of communities out there. Um, but I'm specifically going to be talking and discussing groups who are formed around a, sh a shared common interest um, and where there's voluntary participation. So most of my examples and experience are coming from the tech community and from the Python community, of course. Um, but I think some of this would also be applicable to different types of communities. So maybe you're in other communities outside of the tech world and you might recognize this there as well. And I've also mentioned leadership. And for this discussion, I'm going to define the skill, and this is skill and work that helps to shape an organization. So helping it define its mission and support it in achieving its goals. And just to clarify, leadership is not per se a role, okay? So I will talk a little bit about uh, leadership as, um, as like a skill set, and I will also talk about uh, leadership roles. Um, but leadership itself can be practiced at any level within the framework, any role, or by any member. So you don't have to be stood on the stage to be a community leader. You might be someone who's more comfortable sat in the back row, but you can still help define where the community is going. And I'd like us to also think about how we might incentivize more people to be involved in this kind of work and what barriers there might be um, for people who want to get involved and how we can make our decision making more inclusive so we can help build more sustainable communities and teams. 
So they're the things I'd like you to think about, and these are the things that I would hope that you take away after the talk today. So I'm hoping that you'll have some insights uh, from my personal experience with the PyLadies community, and it's also based around conversations I've had with other members. So while this is my own perspective, it's not just built around my own lived experience, also from conversations with other people in the community. Secondly, I'd like us to all reconsider a little bit what leaders look like and what they do, and whether the current definitions are really serving us and serving our communities and our teams in the way that would uh, be best. And last, but certainly not least, I'd really like to use this platform that I've so kindly been given to be able to celebrate and give recognition to all of the amazing community leaders that I've met and that I'm aware of. Some of them I'm sure you're already familiar with, so hopefully there'll be some familiar faces up there. Some of them are in this room, um, but I really want to take this opportunity because I'm so grateful to have it, to recognize all that amazing work that different people are doing in the community. Okay, so it's probably a good time to give you a little bit more context about who I am and why I have brought this topic to PyCon. So my name's Jessica, I use she, her pronouns, and I'm a software engineer at Ecosia. If you haven't heard of us, we're the uh, search engine for a better planet. However, if you'd found me five years ago, you probably would have found me serving coffee at the tech uh, conferences, or roasting coffee, or pouring uh, hearts into milk. And if you'd found me 10 years ago, I was running around film sets, putting little bits of tape next to actors' feet and uh, charging batteries, all the really exciting stuff, of course. And uh, <laughs> so I'm quite new to the tech sector, um, but I've been involved in various communities throughout these different careers. And as someone who has no formal training in uh, tech, I define myself as a self-taught slash community-taught developer. And in the full ethos of that spirit, that's not a phrase that I coined. Um, I have stolen it from a really great community member called Daniel Rios, and he coined this in a talk that he gave to Django Girls Berlin when I was first starting out. So I know we have Django Girls also happening on Sunday, which is really cool. This is a great way um, for people starting to learn Django and also to support new people into getting into the industry. And this talk is absolutely community-driven. So it's drawing, as I mentioned, from lots of conversations and different um, experiences from other people in the community or people I've seen talk in the community. And I will be referencing them along the way and trying to really give them some platform here. And I really recommend you all to follow them on uh, their social media accounts. And you'll also find my slides um, hopefully this link, it's a little hard with the underscores, um, but here I have a full transcription also of the talk, um, slightly previous version, of course, it's not live trans transcription, but in case anybody prefers or needs a transcription, it's up there, and also the slides are there as well. So I'm celebrating five years this year, in the Python community, which is super exciting. How many people are under five years in the Python community? How many people are oh, uh, under eight years? Under 10? How many people are over 10? There we go. Wow, okay, so it's such a great community because you get this real mix of people at different points. Um, and yet you find people who stick around because they love this community so much. Um, I first joined in autumn 2017 when I joined my first Pi Ladies meetup. And shortly after that, I became an organizer. So I was like corresponding with emails, talking to hosts, speakers, contributing to the website, and answering messages on Slack. I've also given a number of talks run workshops, mentored other community members, and most recently, I'm really trying to put my efforts into supporting other people to do these things as well. Now, I've mentioned PyLadies a few times, and I feel like maybe most people know by this point who PyLadies are, um, but you know what? 
they can't get enough recognition. So I'm just going to take the opportunity to talk a little bit more about them anyway. They were formed in 2011, so over 10 years now, by these seven women. And their mission was to diversify the Python community through the three pillars of education, conference, and outreach. And they were really motivated to do this by the desire to find like-minded individuals to converse with and for the empowerment that having somebody that looks like you represented brings. Fast forwards over 10 years, and there's chapters all around the world, um, focusing on helping more women become active participants and leaders in the Python open source community. And just to be clear, anyone can join PyLadies, anyone can join this mission and participate, assuming you abide by the code of conduct, of course. Um, and, and, you know, I think it's a really great way to also learn more about the challenges that some people in our community face and how we can actually just make the broader community also more inclusive place to be. All right, so you know a little bit about me and uh, you know a little bit about PyLadies, but I want to tell you now a bit of a story, and that's my story of how I got into the community in the first place. And I want you to also think back to when, you know, was it over 10 years ago, was it five years ago, or maybe it's today, that first time that you joined the Python community. Maybe it was a meetup, maybe it was a conference, um, if you can remember it, think about that. So the event on the left is, um, is it on the left? No, on the right. On your left, yeah. <laughs> Had to think then. I, that's my first event that I ever attended. And um, many of you probably recognize the person in the middle who was um, the speaker for this event, Christian Barra, who has done awesome things in our community. Um, and this was like a hands-on workshop where we were using Jupyter and Pandas uh, to kind of uh, do analysis. And honestly, I couldn't believe it. I mean, I was like, I get to meet people. I get to learn something for free. I get maybe some pizza and a beer. Like, what is this? You know, this is wild. How great is it that we have these things? And I know it's been a hard couple of years because it's been online and it's not been the same. So if you just started in the community, hang in there. It's a lot better um, when we can hopefully do more of this meeting in person. And I'd stumbled across this by chance. I just was like typing Python, Meetup, Berlin, like what is that out there? And I instantly knew this is where I needed to be um, and just how great a feeling it was to see all of these people around me. Having said that, I will say I really struggled when I started out at these meetups. I mean, I don't know if I'm the only one, but half the time I couldn't get things to run on my machine. I would just get the installation running and everyone else was already finished or... I didn't understand the terminology that was being used. I mean, as I mentioned to you, I don't come from this background, so it was kind of really tough. And honestly, a few times I went home really low energy thinking, I, I can't do this. But I kept at it because I saw everybody else there, all these other amazing people who were just, you know, doing this flawlessly or, you know, perception-wise, it looked like it was really easy. I'm sure they were struggling too. <laughs> Hopefully, it's not just me. But I saw them and I thought, okay, if I put time into this, I'm going to get there. So I asked around really shyly, you know, can you help me? I don't know what's going on. I've got a Windows. Everyone else has got Linux um, or Mac. <laughs> and I was really overwhelmed by how friendly everyone is and how much they helped me and gave me tips. They shared resources. And I really felt this sense of belonging. And honestly, that sense of belonging, I just, I hadn't felt that in any of the other spaces, especially the spaces that were not focused on women. I just hadn't felt that sense of belonging um, ever. And that really, you know, that took me a lot because when you then feel it, you realize how much you were kind of missing out. And at another early meetup, I um, was sitting, we were working on microcontrollers. It was run by Christine, who's here in the middle. And this wonderful rainbow-haired woman sat down next to me. Um, of course, she asked first if she may, because she's super polite, and um, kind of then went on and didn't follow the tutorial at all. She just 
coded her own thing. Um, and I was mind blown. I was like, oh, wow, okay, so you can really just be creative with programming. Like, this isn't just about moving a div across a screen or like transforming some data. This is like something you can really be creative with and, uh, you know, make it your own. And that for me like, was really eye opening. And these were these early on moments that really made me appreciate the community, uh, but also made me want to get more involved. So when Agatha and Mei Li, uh, Mei Li is the second in on this side, and Agatha is about on the very end there, they were the organizers at the time. Mei Li actually founded Pi Ladies Berlin, and they were asking for people to help. This is what really got me motivated, this sense of community, this sense of belonging. And I really hope you've all had a chance to feel that. And if you haven't, I hope that you'll feel it over the conference days this weekend. OK, who has been involved in some sort of conference organizing or meet up on, uh, or, you know, in any way? Maybe it was one event, maybe multiple. OK, so did everything go to plan? You, you just never lost a location, the speaker didn't fall ill, food didn't turn up, half of the meetup page didn't come, like, no, okay, so I think I'm not alone in this experience, but the first meetup that I was put in charge of organizing, I was so excited. I mean, we had um, some great speakers from the community talking, I'd organized a location, and they said they were gonna give us food and drink, which was amazing, and you know, you can guess what food. I don't know how it is here in Italy, but in Berlin, it's always pizza, um, which is okay. Which is okay. It's not as probably as good as the pizza here. And there was about 60 people signed up on Meetup.com, which was good uh, at the time. And the organizers said, "Well, they might not all come, so don't overorder with food." But I was really keen and I was really happy that we had this. So I say, go ahead, order 40 to 50 uh, people's worth of pizza. They'll be there, don't worry. And as you can guess, only about half of them came. <laughs> Which luckily, no one says no to free pizza, so people just took it home with them and that was kind of okay. But yeah, the point is, you learn a lot when you're involved in the organization. And you also have to, you get this insight into the behind the scenes work, and you get to talk to community members and see the impact that this has on their lives, both personally and professionally. And for me, that's what really drives me to continue supporting these efforts. However, I would say there's also some benefits to being involved as a community organizer. And the predominant one for me would be visibility. So I found myself talking with companies on a more le uh, level playing field. And th they took a lot more active interest in me because I was involved in the community. And that, that was kind of cool because I was looking for a job. So I, you know, I was kind of thought, I'm going to use that. Um, and I also found myself with more social media followers, which is also cool because then you get to speak to more people and you get to highlight the things that are most important to you for within the community. And I've also been asked to speak at quite a few conferences like this one and I get the opportunity to share all of these ideas with you and highlight the people that I would love to have more recognition. So of course it's been a lot of work to be involved in the community like this and we really have to recognize the effort and the time required to do it. But there are these tangible benefits and the opportunity that you get when you're prominent in the community. And I think we don't always highlight them as much as we could. Uh, and we don't always ensure that they're as accessible to everyone. So when I started, I threw myself into being an organizer. I was trying to think of new content. How could we support more people? Not just to get into the industry, but to just really thrive and advance in their careers. And I meet all these different people who were just brilliant, but often not finding the right opportunities for them, or they just needed a little bit more support to be able to get where they wanted to be. And I felt like our community would be able to provide that support. And the, the community that I'm most pr uh, predominantly part of is Pi Ladies Berlin, which, as I mentioned, was co-founded by Mei Li in 2013. 
And by the time I joined, it already had quite a large community going. They had regular meetups and they had different organizers that had kind of participated and maybe left or come back. So I really got to get in at this point where there was already a lot of that groundwork of building up a community uh, had already been done. And I think, you know, there's some people I know are in this room, like Laser, who's in front of me, who does an amazing job because she's had to build a community up from scratch. I had the opportunity to benefit from some of the work that had been done before me. However, after two years, I was, I was exhausted. I said, I can't do this anymore. It's too much. I'm also trying to become a developer professionally, and I need a break. Um, so I decided to step down. And it was actually consequently when Mei Li, who was the, as I mentioned, co-founder of the group, also stepped down. Um, and during our final meetup together, we talked about all of the things that we had achieved, the successes, things that we had learned, and kind of, you know, shared that out there. And we, we had some new organizers in the group, so we weren't worried that things wouldn't continue to run, um, because they ran fine after we left. But of course, there's always that sense of letting go, which can be quite difficult. And at the end, uh, a long-running member, Maria Jose, who is also a role model of mine, she came over and handed us these books and said, thank you, thank you so much for the work that you've done in the community. And honestly, this was the thing that for me was like, oh wow, I'm stepping back from this now. Like, you know, this was why I did this. So I stepped back, and it was only after I stepped back that I really had the chance to reflect on what being an organizer had meant um, and what were the potential barriers that I saw that maybe other folks, it stopped them from be having this recognition and visibility that I had received. And the first thing I went to think about was, okay, who's shaping the Python and the PyLadies communities? And what does it mean to be one of these people? Um, and I thought some of the leaders that I admire, like Naomi Seda and Teresa Ayofsio and uh, Choi Ting Ho, who's also here at the conference, and like the amazing work that I see them really visibly doing and all the effort they put into making sure stuff is accessible and available to folks. And then I also thought about, well, what's the other type of leadership work that's happening but that we don't know about? So I think there's lots of things, like I mentioned, that aren't as visible or things that we don't give as much recognition to, but they really help shape and make our communities sustainable as well. So I think there's lots of different ways that you can kind of get involved. And you don't have to stand up and say, I'm going to be a community organizer. You can decide what level of commitment is kind of appropriate for you, and it can change over time as well. So I think you might want to just think about participating in surveys and polls, so you can like really give your input and let your voice be heard of like the people who are maybe doing the organizing work. They need that feedback cycle. So even in a small way, you can help lead where the community is going. You might decide to support other members by answering their questions in Slack, because a lot of people, or Discord, if that's the one that your community is using, a lot of people ask beginners questions there, and if they don't get a response, then they won't stay in the community. So this is a really great way of ensuring new people feel encouraged to stay, and that you, they feel supported by us. And you might decide to participate in event organizing. Maybe it's a single event, maybe it's multiple events. You might do coaching, you might do mentoring, or you might do some of these smaller jobs that are like email correspondence, do it, helping with social media. And they have to happen more frequently, but they're often just very small uh, chunks of work. And the seven here is because you never know what the community uh, doesn't know that it needs. So very recently, we started to stream because of the pandemic. So we use StreamYard, and we have this countdown at the start that, you know, does the 30 seconds count down till we start? It's a bit of fun. But one of our members, Christian, he just decided, like, that doesn't represent you well. So I'm going to create you a new countdown. 
it has techno and like you know pink and uh, yellow flashing parts to it because it's Berlin and it's by ladies. Um, and I didn't know that was something we needed, but now it exists. It's really appreciated. So you never know, maybe you see something that we can't see that the community needs. So I mentioned barriers. Okay, so beyond maybe an initial imposter syndrome of not knowing if you can get involved or not, I think time is the biggest barrier that folks uh, have for getting involved, especially if we're talking about using it for essentially unpaid labor. On average, I'm spending about three, four hours a week uh, on community work. And, and that's a good week. Sometimes it's a lot more. It depends what events we have coming up. Um, and normally, it's broken up into small parts. So it's not like big chunks. But it's, you know, it has to be, because it, I don't know if someone's going to respond to me on a Tuesday or a Wednesday or a Thursday. And it's not a problem, because my work supports me. So something we really need, and if you're in a position to be able to do so, but we really need to normalize is companies supporting people to also contribute to communities the way that we talk about open source contributions. So it's great if everyone in the company is supporting open source work by offering coding skills, but we also need to give the same recognition for all of the work that goes into our open source communities. So I think a lot of folks tell us the other thing here is support. And they really want someone to guide and mentor them when they're getting into the community. So they don't want to be the new person that's just given a job and not supported in doing it. They want to be able to have someone who's going to work with them and kind of guide them on what are the things um, that they can and can't do and how best to do them. Because if you've already been in the community for that length of time, you already have some experience that you can pass on. And I think processes there really help too. So something we've been trying to do in PyLadies Berlin is really document and make our processes easier so that we can kind of automate them or make it easier for people to find the information so that we don't have to take as much time explaining every time or that it takes them so long to do because every time they're figuring out the thing that we figured out three times ago. So this is a really big thing of like making sure we have accessible docs on how to run events even. And actually, we did have a lot of this. We found, when we started looking into it, we were like, oh, actually, we have all of this. But no one knew where it was, so that didn't really help. So <laughs> you need to make sure that it's very obvious to new people coming in what is available and what they can find and where they can find it. One thing we've leveraged recently is the Slack workflows. I don't know if folks have used them yet, but it's a great way of when a new person joins, them automatically getting all the information of where the resources are, where they, which channels they can join, or you know, what we recommend, and how to give an introduction, and what is the purpose of the group. And I think on top of this, something that really holds people back is understanding the impact of what this work does. So they kind of think, oh yeah, it'd be great to maybe get involved, but why? And that's fair enough. I think you, know, you, you are going to do something in your own time. You really want to feel what is the motivation for doing so. So for a long time, as I mentioned, we've issued short surveys. This is a great way of like, getting the vibe. But I think we also need to do a lot more work in terms of like, recognition and making the work visible so folks really understand and buy in to how to do this work and why they should bother. One point I want to stress, though, is those things might all be interesting, and they're my thoughts on this. I would love to hear all of your thoughts as well. Um, but, you know, everyone's different. So while that was helpful for me, I think we also have to recognize everyone's experience will be different. And as Pat Kua says in this tweet, um, when a flower doesn't bloom, we fix the environment, not the flower. And not all flowers are thriving in the same environment. So we kind of also need to make sure that we're flexible enough to allow for new ideas and new voices to come in and define what that role looks for them. 
Representation is also something that is going to be really important when we start to talk about leadership and the visible leaders within a group. So McKinsey, for example, have reports that say it boosts productivity and the, the greater the representation in the leadership team, the greater the likelihood of performance and outperformance. And PyLadies, as I mentioned, was created really because of this lack of representation and this so few women at the time being visible in the Python community. And that's why they felt the need to have a group that really focused on that and supported this work for diversifying the Python community. But, you know, we're an open source community and we also believe in intersectional feminism. So we also have to ask ourselves tough questions. Just because PyLadies is focused on underrepresented people in tech, doesn't mean that we're inherently diverse um, or inclusive. And we really just have to put the work in, just like everybody else, to ensure that we're creating a safe space that's not just for ourselves, but also for the, the most marginalized members that we have in our community. And if I want to put this really simply, I'd say this. As someone who presents as white, cis, heterosexual, and neurotypical woman, I cannot know what are the challenges and what are the barriers of other members of the community and what their needs are, especially those who hold less privilege than me. So I really think we have to personally put in the work to bubble up the, most, uh, the voices of the most marginalized folks in the community and be able to support them so that they feel comfortable to do so and also that there's a benefit to them doing so. One model I think we can look at is the Pi Ladies Global Council. Who's already familiar with the council concept? One? Um, okay, so the Global Council was created during the 2019 PyCon, and it was formed to support all of the chapters, because currently, and this will still be true, all the chapters are decentralized, which means every chapter can operate how it wants. Um, and like kind of, you know, follow the code of conduct, but like there's no strict rules on how you can run your chapter, which is one of the great things about PyLadies, but it also means that there's not a lot of support when your chapter is new and you're looking for things like money. So they formed this council. It has nine seats and six seats are selected by public elections and they each have a two-year service commitment. And... What they really wanted to put in place was they wanted to ensure that there was a diversity and inclusion requirement that meant that the maximum number of seats that could be filled by people from the same country of residency would be three. And this is a mechanism to really ensure the space is there for new ideas and different perspectives. And this means that more people will have the opportunity to participate because as a tenure, it rotates and it won't be stuck that it's the same people for multiple years over and over again. At a local level, this is way less structured, but by encouraging new members to join our communities, I think we can make space for people to, you know, jump in and have a go. Maybe they step back, maybe you step back in. But I really think it's really helpful, not just for us as individual uh, contributors, because community burnout is a big problem and it needs a lot more awareness, but I think it's also way better for our communities because it makes them more sustainable and makes them more likely to continue to go on when the current leaders step back. Just take a sip of water. Okay, and it's not just about being representative in terms of who's visibly leading, it's also about reaching out to more folks within the community and making sure that we're including different perspectives, especially when we're uh, creating decisions. As Anil Dash says in this article about the old boys club is for losers, those who are reaching out to include all members of their community who are seeking out new ideas and voices are not only winning, but will continue to do so. So I think we have to make sure that we're really proactive when we're reaching out to different members and talking to them. And I really encourage this. I love this Pac-Man rule that we have at PyCon because it's a great way to talk to someone that you never spoke to before. You probably wouldn't speak to them on the street, 
But here at this conference, you have that opportunity. And I think, honestly, there's many reasons why we should be doing this. There are benefits, real benefits, like productivity, or you know, that it's a, it creates a safe space for everybody. And that's, that's really true, but I think we also have to be comfortable with the fact that this is just what we should be doing. And we really have to like, get out of the mindset of there needs to be a payoff for us to do it, like you know, Facebook and Twitter are doing it, so it's trendy to have like a DNI council or you know, so forth. This, yes, is great, and it really incentivizes us, and it helps us to incentivize other people who might be slightly less uh, open to this concept. But I think we also have to acknowledge that this is just the right thing: is to make sure that we're an inclusive space where everyone has uh, access to the same benefits as everybody else. So I think something we can work on um, to, do, to do this better is building frameworks for inclusive decision making. And I think it has to be uh, transparent and very clear in its requirements. And that doesn't mean that every decision has to be signed off by every community member. Um, but we do need to ensure that we've covered many different perspectives. And that means that you won't always get the, you know, the outcome that you personally wanted, but you also get to know that this has been informed and has different perspectives in it and has a more inclusive approach. So how can we do this? So I think the first thing is, as I mentioned earlier, is accessibility. So decision-making really needs to be accessible. We have to sh make sure that we're not gatekeeping who has access to things such as Slack channels or contacts or funding or accounts and opportunities. You know, of course, we're technologists, so I'm not just saying we should put all of our passwords out on the internet. No. <laughs> we have to do this like with a privacy and security mindset. But there are, there's so much tooling out there. So we can certainly achieve this. And I think often what holds us back is more the sense of, oh, no, what if something goes wrong? And we, you know, we should be careful, but we need to make sure that we're also not holding back from people. And similarly, we need to really make sure that decisions are transparent so anybody can see the process behind it. One thing that we've done recently is starting to have monthly, meet, uh, monthly leadership meetings. And this meeting's really, you know, it's one of the meetings that decides where this community is going. And we want to ensure that we have the possibility for any member, should they want to, to join and give their input. So we used to do everything in a private uh, Slack channel. And the thing is, we did that because we felt it was more efficient, it was more direct. And maybe that's true to a certain extent, but the thing is then no one else had any idea about how we got to a conclusion or you know, what work had to be done to decide how our t-shirts would look or our presence at a conference would be. So we started to also put stuff in as many public channels as possible. And that doesn't mean everyone has to be involved. They can subscribe, they can just observe. But at some point, when they feel comfortable, then they have the possibility to have their input. And as I've already mentioned, representation is very important. And it's not always possible to have a leadership group that is completely representative of your uh, members in the community. But you also need to ask why it might not be more representative. What are the barriers, as I mentioned, that are stopping folks from taking up those roles? And if they can't take on the role, are there ways that they can also participate in the decision making? And this leads me back to recognition. So I think ensuring that leadership work is really recognized and rewarded is one way to encourage more people to do it. Because, you know, we all like to maybe give some free time for the community. Um, but, you know, we also want a tangible reason that makes sense for us to put all of those hours in. Because, you know, we could otherwise be watching Netflix or we could be doing a new Python course and furthering ourselves in our career. And they're both valuable. You know, like your free time is your free time and you want to do with it what you want to do. So we need to ensure that there is an incentive for people to get involved. This means 10 minutes left, or? Okay, yeah, cool. Perfect. <laughs> um, 
yeah, and with all the four mentioned, I think we also have to ensure that there's space for innovation. So new ideas, new formats, and we really need to refrain from answers like, well, it didn't work like that last time, or ah, I don't think it's going to work like that. You know, maybe sometimes the lesson that needs to be learned is that, you know, it's better done another way. Um, I also don't agree in this whole like, you know, oh, you have to learn the hard way, so let's make the same mistake 10 times. But we also have to make sure that we're ensuring that people feel enough autonomy to do what they want to do in these roles. So now that I've given a little few ideas around the things in the community and how it looks and what my experience has been there, I would just like to kind of, before we end, talk a little bit to bring that back to leadership roles in the professional tech teams uh, that we are part of. So as I mentioned, in parallel to all this community work I've been doing, I've also become an engineer, and I've started to look at the different trajectories for myself as an engineer or the engineers around me. And um, one of the reasons why this was really coming up in my mind was at Ecosia, where I work, um, we have gender parity, actually, in the engineering team, which is amazing, and it's also kind of sad that I have to mention that that's amazing, but it's, it's pretty great. The problem is we don't have that in our tech lead group. That is a very homogenous group, and this is the group that's predominantly involved in decision-making. So we started to do training and think about why this was and define what the role was to make it clearer you know, what people do in this role, and that's kind of what me got me really thinking about this also uh, in terms of the community. Because a lot of the um, desirable things, uh, the skills that they saw for tech lead roles are actually a lot of the skills that I see people already displaying in the community. And very few of those people are actually tech leads professionally. And it turns out, shock horror, we're not alone. So, like, this is an industry-wide problem uh, where we tend to, you know, we know that gender parity is already a problem, but, like, we see even less uh, women who are in um, leadership roles, less than 10% of startups in the world are owned or led by women, and despite there being a good trend of women in leadership roles, only 25% women are confident that they could be promoted to executive management in their company. And if we look at this in an intersectional uh, manner, we see it's even more dire. So black women, for example, only make 18% of entry roles in tech compared to 30% for white women. So even getting in is more difficult. So the discussion at Ecosia led us to really do a lot of training, including one run by Pat Kua, who I actually quoted earlier. And I started to think about what the qualities of uh, leaders are. And what I found, as I mentioned, interesting is that a lot of these aligned with the things in the communities. The thing is, community leaders, they don't lean on a position of power. Like, we can't make members of the community do anything. We have to get buy-in from them. We have to create something that is interesting enough for everyone to come here when it's super hot in Florence and they could be out eating gelato, right? You know, like, <laughs> it's, it's a much more uh, difficult job, I would say. And I think we're also very interestingly um, positioned uh, to take on this leadership that we learn in the community and apply it elsewhere in the world because we often work with people from all different areas of the world uh, and kind of have this opportunity to really practice inclusive leadership in the community. So I think when we think about growing new leaders and we want to do so in an equitable fashion, thinking about the barriers and the perception that someone might not meet all of our current definition of a role is really important. So for example, if someone is a parent and they work only part-time, maybe there's a way to ensure that they can also participate in this kind of role rather than just saying, oh no, this doesn't work because you have to be full-time. Something which I've heard <laughs> was the case. All right, so before I wrap up, I just want to leave you a few ideas on how we can encourage more new folks in teams to try out leadership roles or work. Um, I've got five minutes, so I can manage that. All right, so co-leading or splitting a role can allow someone to do it, but without the full commitment, or if they don't work full-time, maybe this is a great way to be able to allow somebody else to participate in the decision-making. 
Um, I think looking at a rotation, like what I mentioned with Pi Ladies Council, really helps to ensure that there is a defined set of period when people are involved and when they step back and take a break and someone new comes in. Maybe defining what the role is right now and then being open to redefining it, depending on the people that you maybe see who have these leadership skills in your team. And mentor others so that they also have the opportunity to kind of do this in a safe way where they don't feel like they've just been thrown in the deep end and, uh, you know, it's too overwhelming for them. I think that leads me to training because leadership is a trained skill. It's not just because you've been a developer or in a different role for a number of years. This is something new. It's something that has to be continually to be trained, uh, not just like a one-off. And I think it's important because, as Tweet mentions, our industry is really young and it's like hyper growth. So there's a lot of new ideas that are floating around there. We already know in our jobs as programmers, we have to keep learning, keep learning. And I think leadership is a really similar skill set. And lastly, we have to make the effort worth it. So I blanked this out because I know it was yeah, slightly explicit language, but you know, this is the thing. It's like this conversation of women, women and gender minorities in tech is not new at all, but there's still this overhead of being in spaces and trying to make yourself visible or heard. And that's like extra work that those people are putting in. And when you're not aware of it, it's a little difficult to kind of see how that looks, but this just means that you're working twice as hard to achieve the same thing. So I think we have to really recognize that and make sure that we're incentivizing people, not just based on like the one part of their job that they're doing, but also recognize all the additional work that they may be facing. So really short summary, because I think I'm close to time, but I really encourage you all to challenge what current structures that you have in your teams, listen actively to people around you and amplify the voices of others, especially those who are most uh, more marginalized. Let's look to our communities and other communities to build stronger and more sustainable teams and give recognition to those who are doing this work in our, in our communities, but maybe not getting the visibility they deserve. So of course, at the start, I mentioned this is community-driven talk, and it absolutely is, so I have a lot of folks that I want to thank, and the next slides are just purely thank you slides. So while I go through them, I really encourage you to think, who in the community do you want to thank? Like, who are you grateful for who is like helping lead this community that you're part of, or you've just joined if this is your first conference? Uh, and maybe you want to send them a tweet or let them know how much you appreciate the work that they're putting in. And to close, I'd like to thank everybody that's here. I'd really like to thank uh, PyCon Natalia, to Flora, Patrick, and Matteo for putting the trust in me uh, and that they invited me here and said, hey, can you come and talk? Uh, it's such a great conference to be a part of. Of course, I wasn't sure because I haven't been here before how the community would be, but I knew from the minute I heard the opening notes that people would be on board with this. And I really look forward to having conversations with you all after this talk and throughout the three days about this topic and any others. So, thank you. Thank you, thank you, very interesting topic. So, we have a few questions, actually five questions. Okay. The first one is, what would you advise to someone who comes from a very different, very different academic background and wants to join the tech one? Um, community, <laughs> always community. Go, uh, I mean, I think it's a little, been a little bit more difficult in the last couple of years because everything's been remote. But for me, learning alone will get you so far but you get very demotivated very quickly or things get overwhelming really quickly. Like, you know, if you're not super um, computer literate, like, I mean, I, I grew up, I had a computer, I never looked at the terminal before. So, you know, even just getting Python installed can be a difficult step. And if you're coming from a different background and you wanna go into tech, I would really say join a community and find people who are in the same mindset as you and will support you. 
Thank you. Second one. Um, what would be a leader approach to someone who does not play fairly in the team? A leader approach to someone who does not play fairly in the in team. team. Yeah, I, think, I guess that could be interpreted in lots of different ways. So I think it would depend specifically on how someone was not playing fairly. Um, but yeah, I think when you're a lead and you have people who... Um, maybe one example I can give is uh, when we do meetings, we run a lean coffee style approach. Um, and we say, you know, when your topic's up, you can talk about it. When it's not your topic, then you yield the time to the person whose topic it is. And we would have people who, you know, decided that their topic was more important and they would just keep talking about it. And I think what's very important is that you are supportive but firm. Um, because a lot of other people in the community look to you. So similarly, if you have code of conduct breaches, which is a very difficult topic uh, for most people in the community, um, because again, we don't have like a, it's not a legal thing. It's a, like a, you know, a contract that we all agree to, beha you know, behave in a certain way. If you don't show that you're really willing to act on the code of, con uh, on the code of conduct, then people don't feel safe. So you have to be firm. You have to, you know, you have to be willing to be uncomfortable and go up to people and say, look, this is not what we've all agreed on. So you need to, you know, kind of like pay attention and uh, either you join us in the way that we've all agreed and in a way that's inclusive of everyone here, or you don't. Thank you. So uh, the, another question. Uh, what do you do when you get too many options on one single topic? For example, t-shirt design or logos or colors or whatever. Vote, vote, yeah. We do, we do a poll and we vote and the majority wins. I mean, yeah, this is what I mean. Not everyone is going to have like the outcome that they preference. We had this recently with t-shirt designs and we had one design that someone really, really loved, but it didn't win. So, you know, that's sure. fair is fair. We often rely on lots of open source in our job and the surrounding communities for finding new talent in firms. Yeah. How do you feel about community engagement meet metrics being worked into career progression paths to in, um, incentivize it better? Uh, so from companies, does this mean, I assume, like companies saying like, oh, we're, we're involved in these communities and... I. Uh, actually, maybe, yeah. who did this question? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. So, so I, I mean, I think um, it's really great that lots of companies come to these communities and say, oh, we want to support you. And normally it's really evident when they just want to use you for metrics. Um, <laughs> so it's normally quite easy to like split out who's really here because they want to support your community and who's here because they, they want the recognition of joining the community, uh, of looking good in metrics. I think um, inherently there's no problem with like having metrics and saying, hey, we support this community or we support that community. But I think uh, if, you, if you're really honestly wanting to do it, then you don't need to shout about it. Do it, everyone will talk about it. This, this is the best form of recognition for this thing of like, you know, people know about the work I do in the community, so they know about Ecosia that way. You don't always have to like be really vocal about it. I think um, it can be a bit tricky. And I think one thing is, a lot of companies, you know, they, they want to sell themselves, they want to get people involved. That's why they stand here and say, you know, we allow our developers to get involved in open source and so forth. And I think that's really great. That's somewhere I want to work. But then they don't see the same thing for when someone's putting hours into organizing a community event, which is also contributing to open source. So again, we have to question, you know, what are we giving visibility and recognition to and what not? Great, thank you. Uh, I think we have enough time for a couple of questions more. Yeah, sure. So, at my company, we are very inclusive and supportive, but very often the application pool of new applicants is not very diverse. What do you suggest to encourage more application from minority groups while keeping the same technical standard? 
Yeah, I mean... Is it clear uh, enough, the question? Yeah, yeah, it's clear okay. enough. Um, I think it's a bit of a fallacy that you would have to lower technical quality uh, to have a diverse team, personally. Um, and I think, uh, you know, the thing is, is like, yeah, sure, you don't see that in the pool, but then you have to question why people aren't um, applying there. And you also maybe need to be a little bit more proactive in going out and finding where there's different groups of people. So uh, a lot of, a lot of uh, companies, when they come to buy ladies, you know, part of it's hiring, of course. And that's kind of a win-win because we also want to get hired. Right, Not, like a lot of the people in the community are looking for jobs, or would consider moving. Um, so I think it's mutually beneficial. I think it's okay to be like, okay, well the pool's not there, but you you have to really say, are you doing everything? Are you really doing everything to ensure that you kind of get more candidates through the door? And honestly, most of the time when I speak to people and speak to different companies, they're not. So I don't know about this person's company and I don't want to make an assumption, but I think that there is often things that you can do and I would say a lot of them are go out and um, you know, support the different communities around you, find out more about them, listen to what their needs are, what people do they have that might be interesting. Um, also look into building up junior roles, can't say that enough. Um, too often it's like senior, 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 and we need to start building up more talent, otherwise we're going to have real problems in this industry. Okay, last question. Uh, how about the compromise about working for the community and working for your software engineer job or your company? It's the same? It's something that you have to compromise about time? On um. Well, one pays me money and one doesn't, so... <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, and that's the, the one, point of view. <laughs> of course, one has to take slight priority. Like, I can't slack off my job if I want to still be employed. Um, I'm, like I mentioned, I'm really fortunate that I'm in a company that recognized the advantage of the work I do, and they've supported me throughout the whole time I've worked there to do this. Um, but, yeah, I mean, of course... <sighs> Yeah, there is a compromise. I, couldn't, I can't do as much as I would love to do in the community uh, because I also have to work full time and I also want to have some time off and there's just one of me and 24 hours in a day. And if anyone figures out how to fix any of those things, then let me know. <laughs> Thank you. So we run out of time. Thank you again for being Thank with you, us. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.